Let's take back your time. Co-author of Affluenza and What is the Economy For Anyway, and editor of Take Back Your Time, the PBS special. As a documentary filmmaker, he lives in Seattle, Washington, and has taught the Ever at the Evergreen State College. I'm pleased and honored to present John McGrath. Thank you, Seth, and it, it is such an honor to be here, to have been invited to deliver this year's Gold Metcalf Lecture by Dr. Lynn Anderson, who is one of my absolute very favorite people in the whole recreation world. I know some of the previous Gold Metcalf lecturers, and I'm blown away, frankly, to be considered uh, honorable to be in their company. I've also learned about Dr. Metcalf himself, and what an amazing, inspiring man, and I don't have to tell you about him, you know all about him. And this conference, 66 years. I was a toddler back then, now I'm a geezer. What an incredible job the students have done in putting this together. I want to thank all of them who have helped take care of me, and I uh, wish I could name them all, but uh, I sure appreciate it. So please give those students a round of applause. to talk about Route 66 and our National Park Centennial and to tie those two things to my work as co-founder and president of Take Back Your Time, an organization that has been fighting overwork and what we call time poverty in America for 14 years. And I thought, I can do that. So let's go. And I'm just going to talk, no PowerPoint. Uh, as my friend Conrad Schmidt, the founder of the Work Less Party in British Columbia, and yes, there is such a thing, believe it or not, uh, says power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so I intend to be provocative, but I hope not to be obnoxious. As we celebrate the centennial of the National Park Service, the organization to, uh, to administer our multiple treasures, it might be helpful to pause and ask whether in another hundred years we would still have constituencies for our parks and wildlands. The author Wallace Stegner once called our national parks America's best idea. Not everyone agrees, but few would deny that the idea of preserving areas of great scenic, historic, cultural, or biological value is a worthy concept. In 1864, during a time when Americans were killing each other on grim battlefields, President Abraham Lincoln set aside the incomparable Yosemite Valley of California as a national legacy for generations to come, beginning a process that has been duplicated the world over since then. Today, America's hundreds of national parks, monuments, and recreation areas are as loved as ever. Loved to death, some say, but I don't agree with that. Total visitation topped 307 million last year, many from other countries, the highest ever in the National Park Service's history. But the quality, the quality of that visitation is changing. We seem to be more in a hurry than ever, pressured by hectic work schedules and overloaded by other commitments and digital information. So while more visitors are coming to the parks, they're not staying nearly as long. Meanwhile, a significant movement is chipping away at our legacy of national preservation. Activists in many western states want to turn nationally protected lands over to state and local authorities and ultimately to privatize them. They are willing to bring weapons into national wildlife refuges to make their points. Protecting our parks against these threats over the next century requires a public that fully appreciates and experiences the value of these places. Already our national parks have under unfunded maintenance costs of nearly 12 billion dollars with some 500 million needed for repairs to Yosemite alone and another 338 million for the Grand Canyon. But where will the support for these parks come from if Americans don't have enough time to really spend in them? 
When I was at Yosemite's spectacular tunnel view a few years ago, I watched in disbelief as visitors poured out of their vehicles and rushed to snap photos, bringing cameras or smartphones to their eyes before they'd even looked at the scene. Their first view of that magnificent 3,000-foot granite wall, El Capitan, was mediated through a lens. And none of you have ever done that, right? I didn't think so. Those were the visitors who had time to stop. Many others simply rolled by in their cars, taking photos out the windows. The idea seemed to be to collect as many quick pictures as possible so as to post them online as proof that one had conquered yet another park. Been there, shot that, one more on the bucket list. A generation ago, the average Yosemite visitor spent 48 hours at the park, but now such visits last a mere 4.8 hours. Over at Grand Canyon National Park, the average stay is even shorter. Visitors spend just 17 minutes looking at the magical abyss. A friend described witnessing a family whose car pulled into a canyon parking lot. Father hopped out, slammed the door, and said, stay in the car, I'll get the shot. Can you imagine that? How can one learn to love our parks, to fully absorb the vast beauty and profound experiences they offer with eyes constantly on the clock? And what does this drop in the amount of time Americans are spending in our parks mean for the future of our wild spaces, not to mention the future of recreation as a profession. I almost feel that the national parks are part of my DNA. It was, first of all, extended childhood visits to Yosemite that made me the leisure advocate I've become. My father loved to hike, camp, and fish, and in June of 1958, when I was 11, he proposed that the two of us go backpacking in Yosemite. To this day, it remains my favorite place on the earth. At the age of 13, I started to do some camping without my father, together with my best friend, John Ellsworth. By the end of our first year in high school, my father was convinced that we knew what we were doing. So he agreed to drive us to Yosemite and let us go backpacking on our own. We weren't yet 15. John's parents agreed to pick us up a few weeks later. The only stipulation was that we call home collect once a week and send a postcard or two. We each had $20 to buy food and whatever else we might need during our trip. In those days, it was enough. Each following summer during high school, I spent six happy weeks with John and other friends hiking Sierra trails and hitchhiking between trailheads. For several years, I recorded all my trips in a small brown book that I still have. Reading through it today, I realize again what a blessed childhood I had, full of the best kind of freedom which my parents gave me instead of a lot of useless stuff. You know, backpacking teaches you a lot about life, that you can be happy with little. More isn't always better when you have to carry it on your back. You may want the items, but you don't want the weight. Remember Reese Witherspoon in that movie, Wild? I don't know how many saw that. Realized quickly she had to get rid of things. You learn balance, and that's a really good lesson for Americans. My friend John later became a ranger near Yosemite. I too had hoped to work in the park, though life had other ideas for me. But I understand now that early on I was learning that happiness came from self-chosen activities shared with others and didn't need to cost a lot. I realized I was earning the pride that came from self-reliance and the joy that came from experiences in the natural world. When we were in the mountains, there were local hills and ponds to explore and time to explore them, since our parents hadn't scheduled dozens of activities for us, as seems to be the norm today. All I remember mom saying when I came home from school was, go out and play. <laughs> While we did our backpacking mainly in the summer, Occasionally, we went during colder times of the year. So at Thanksgiving break in 1962, two of my friends and I were planning a winter <coughs> adventure in the desolation wilderness near Lake Tahoe. There was one problem, though, in my case. I'd been fighting a very painful sinus infection for several weeks with constant headaches. 
I really didn't feel up to the trip physically, and of course my mother warned me not to go. You'll get pneumonia, she declared. So of course, I went anyway. Now I say this with sadness now because my mom passed away two months ago today, and I miss her a lot. We camped at the edge of the wilderness that first night. Very little snow had fallen yet, and hiking the next day on the trail to the Lake of the Woods was easy. The distance was short, and by late morning we had set up camp on the shore of the frozen lake and were ready to climb Pyramid Peak, the highest in the area. I was out of shape from my illness and quickly fell behind my fellow hikers. As we neared the top of the nearly 10,000 foot peak, the wind was fierce and bitterly cold. I was gasping for breath, and my head still throbbed with pain. We spent only a short time on the summit and then headed back to camp the way we had come. By then I was exhausted, struggling to keep up. My headache grew worse and I remembered my mother's warnings. When we got back to camp, my buddies let me crawl into my sleeping bag while they prepared hot soup and cups of tea. Soon it was dark, and despite the sinus pain, I quickly fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up suddenly and grabbed for my glasses. We were sleeping without a tent, covered only by tarps. We were crazy kids, and I saw immediately that the sky was perfectly clear, a canopy of stars with a big moon in the middle. The entire area was bathed in brilliant moonlight. It seemed as easy to see as at midday. It was also perfectly still, without a breath of wind. Clear mountain nights are often very cold, but this one was surprisingly mild. It seems that a warmer front had blown in, and the temperature was probably not much below freezing. It took a moment, but I suddenly noticed something else. My head no longer hurt. After a couple of months of constant pain, I felt absolutely numb. I couldn't quite believe it, but a peace and calm had fallen over me that I had never experienced before, nor ever since. I got up and walked over to a rocky point on the lake shore in the bright moonlight. I stared uh, quietly across the lake still frozen, to the dark ridge of Pyramid Peak beyond and the sparkling sky overhead. It was the most profound spiritual experience of my life, and though I am not formally religious, it left me feeling that was, there was a purpose to the universe and to my life, and that things would turn out well if I placed my trust in Providence and did the right things. Like my sickness, other trials would pass, and I was going to be all right. I remember grateful tears of joy streaming down my face as I looked out at this calm and perfect, silent night all around me. I will never forget that night, and I know it has shaped my life in ways I will probably never understand. Surely it taught me that the best things in life aren't things. And it made an environmentalist out of me. A 2006 Cornell University study of 2,000 children found that direct and extended time in wild nature, hiking, camping, playing in the woods, was essential to both their attitudes about the environment and their daily environmental behaviors. People who engaged in these kinds of activities before the age of 11 were more likely as adults to express pro-environmental attitudes and to indicate that they were involved in pro-environmental behaviors, reported authors Nancy Wells and Christy Leckie. By contrast, time spent in domesticated nature, tending gardens, picking flowers, and that's wonderful time spent, I'm not putting it down in any sense, but time spent in domesticated nature had much less impact on both attitudes and behaviors, and the same was true for environmental education programs. So indeed, while I spent hours every day in carefree games and unstructured nature activities, today's children only engage in such play for about an hour a week. It's not only because they spend hours in front of screens, it's also because their after school hours are usually taken up in scheduled sports, tutoring, and other extracurricular activities. My carefree time as a teenager, often spent on the trails of Yosemite, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon National Parks, 
seemed to me the essence of freedom. I couldn't imagine a nine to five job, and for many years afterwards, I worked only odd jobs, nine months a year, so I could have my summers free. And you could do that in those days. Things didn't cost so much, and you didn't have a lot of college debt, all of those things. I was living in northern Minnesota by then, uh, but in June, when the land greened up and the warm breezes rose over the roads, I set off from my western mountains alone or with a partner. Hitchhiking was my mode of travel, another kind of freedom that, above all, required time. You could never be sure when you'd arrive somewhere or even what bridge you'd sleep under that night. Hitchhiking seems to be a lost experience now, though I met a student here who's just done a bunch of hitchhiking. Very cool to hear that. But in the late 1960s and early 1970s, everybody did it. Life, indeed, was a highway. One of my favorite routes was Highway 66, which ran from Chicago to Los Angeles. I particularly liked the part which ran across New Mexico and Arizona, where Interstate 40 runs today. It was beautiful, desert country, but the road was often slow going because there were so many hitchhikers in those days. <laughs> Nevertheless, someone always stopped to pick me up. They were always kind, Navajo Indians with rooms in the back of their pickup trucks, bored businessmen looking for conversation, hippies in brightly painted microbuses. I have lots of memories from Route 66, both bad and good. There was a time the police threw me in jail in Grants, New Mexico, and searched all of my belongings for marijuana. <laughs> they were not friendly, and they seemed sure they would find something. But thankfully, I was clean. <laughs> the cell was tiny, dark, and smelly. A young Hispanic kid in there with me had been there for four days, and they still hadn't told him what he'd done. I don't know what happened to him. But after a couple of hours, they let me out and told me they'd arrest me if I hitchhiked again in town. A police car followed me all the way to the city limits, three miles in the blazing heat. On the positive side on Route 66 were the hippies who picked me up in their VW bus. A lot of peace on the side. Remember those days? Maybe you do. As we drove through Arizona's colorful painted desert, one of them kept saying, Wow, look at all that nature. Would you look at all that nature? Oh, that is so cool. Oh my God, I would like to be right out there, way out there in the middle of all that nature. Then she paused. She added, with a stereo playing Led Zeppelin and a tab of mescal. Ah, nature. <laughs> the natural. Perhaps my love for the simple life comes from being born in San Francisco, the city of St. Francis. Francis is sort of everybody's favorite saint, and mine too, so let me tell you why. More than 40 years ago, I first saw Brother Sun, Sister Moon, Franco Zifferelli's film about the life of Francis. Some of you may have seen it. It's in many respects a very typical movie, all hallmark pretty, every scene shot in the golden hour, then too, Lady Claire always looked like she just walked off the set of a Lady Claire All commercial. <laughs> Nonetheless, the film contained a valuable message. It spoke to the positive essence of religion. It portrayed Francis as a Christian rebel against the growing materialism of his day. Francis challenged his father, a very rich textile merchant whose wealth came from the exploitation of his workers and whose life revolved around calculations of economic profit and loss. What's it all for, this business, this busyness that so consumes my father, Francis asked. Instead, Francis called his peers to savor the wonders of creation and to care for it, to embrace lady poverty. He reminded them of Christ's words about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air who neither sow nor reap, yet are more beautiful than King Solomon in all his glory. He warned them that they could not serve both God and money. 
And Francis asked them to take the time to discover what really matters in life. He asked them to slow down and be here now. And that was at a time when, by modern standards, they were all tortoises. <laughs> the music in the movie was performed by the folk singer Donovan. And it was too sappy for most people's tastes, including my own. But the words to one of the songs have stayed with me all these years. If you want your dreams to grow, take your time. Go slowly. Do few things, but do them well. Simple gifts are holy. We live in a very different world with ideas very different from those Francis was about. Our dream is a different, different dream. If Donovan wanted to write a song expressing our temporal values, it might go something like this. If you want your dream to grow, work all day, go faster, do a lot, then do some more. Work should be your master. These days it's not remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's remember the smartphone and keep it handy. I'm afraid that in America work has become our other deity right up there with materialism. We are stuffed with things and starving for time. And yet time is a family value without which families crumble. Time is needed if we are to eat properly, exercise properly, and sleep long enough to be healthy and alert. Time is required if we are to be servants in our communities and stewards of creation. Time is necessary to love and to live. And especially time, especially with others and with nature, is essential to happiness but we're running out of it. I invite you to reflect on what has happened to our time in America. What has happened to your time? Why have so many of us come to feel so burdened by tasks we haven't got time to accomplish? Why for so many of us has life become a rat race? Why are we Americans working more, more today than we were a generation ago? more than the citizens of most all other industrial countries, leaving little time for leisure. It wasn't supposed to be this way. My personal interest in this issue goes back some 48 years to the fall of 1968. I was studying sociology in college in Wisconsin, and we were considering what important social problems America would face at the end of the 20th century problems we sociologists would be called upon to help solve. Of course there was racism. 1968 was the year Martin Luther King was assassinated after all. And there was poverty. There was hunger and war. We were smack dab in the quicksands of Vietnam. But then, then there was this other problem. A U.S. Senate subcommittee had predicted that by the year 2000, we'd be working only 14 to 20 hours a week, with 7 to 10 weeks of vacation a year. Some of you may remember those predictions. In fact, they were the reason that so many leisure education and recreation programs started coming up around the country during that time. The conventional wisdom was that with automation and cybernation, a popular word used then to describe the commuter revolution we knew was coming and that we're all involved in today, with all the labor-saving devices we were creating daily, we would have so much leisure time on our hands, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Now, I have to admit, I thought that was a problem I could deal with. <laughs> but of course, the problem we now face is precisely the opposite. For many of us, the idea of leisure time is a distant dream, like winning the lottery. We're not worried about what to do with too much time. We are overwhelmed because we have too little. What went wrong? What went wrong with these predictions of leisure? We got the technology. Our productivity per worker hour has way more than doubled since 1968. More than doubled. 
we could be working about half as much as we were then and still have a material standard of living that even today would be the envy of two thirds of the world. We could have taken part of our productivity gains in wage increases and part in more time. We could have, but we didn't. Unconsciously or otherwise, we chose as a society to take all of our increased productivity and trade it for more goods and services. Of course, most of us didn't even get the stuff. As we are now increasingly aware, the lion's share of that went to the very rich, the 1%, if you will. Yet even now, even now, we are told that to put people to work and lift others out of poverty, we must continue to grow the economy even faster. Even many of our progressive economists tell us that. The worship of economic growth is the glue that binds Democrats and Republicans who otherwise seem to have almost nothing in common. But wait a minute. We are already on a collision course with the natural limits of the biosphere. We need to find a way of achieving well-being for all without constant growth. And rich countries need to curb their appetites to allow growth in countries that are truly poor. We all have personal heroes. I'm sure you have a personal hero. I have a personal hero. Mine is a, a famous 20, 20th century environmentalist, David Brower. Some call him the heir to John Muir. He led the fight for many national parks, uh, led the, the last part of the fight for the National Wilderness Act. I knew David for the last 28 years of his life, and I visited him in the hospital a week before he died at the age of 88. It was clear that the end was near. He was suffering from cancer. But being an optimist, I left with a cheery remark, hoping I would make him feel better. So I said that uh, the next time I saw him, I hoped that he would be feeling good and healthy again and out there fighting the good fight. <coughs> Dave Brower looked me in the eye and he said, John, I don't think that's in the cards, but it's been a great 88 years. I think that's what we all want to be able to say when our lives come to a close, no matter how much time we get on this earth. David Brower died a satisfied man, but a worried one. In many of his speeches, he used a powerful metaphor to point out the absurdity of our current faith in growth. He compressed the age of the earth, estimated by scientists at some 4.6 billion years, or billion, how, does Carl, how did Carl say it? A lot better. Into one week, the biblical week of creation, if you will. So when you do this, when you take the age of the earth and you put it into one week, a day represents about 650 million years, an hour 27 million years, a minute about 450,000 years, and a second 7,500 years. On Sunday morning, the beginning of the week, the earth congeals from cosmic gases. In the next few hours, land masses and oceans begin to form, and by Tuesday afternoon, the first tiny proto-cells of life emerge. In the next few days of creation, these life forms become larger, more complex, and ever more wondrous. Before dawn on the last day, Saturday, trilobites and other strangely shaped creatures swim by the millions in the Cambrian Sea. Half a billion years later in real time, we will be amazed by their fossils scattered about the globe. Around the middle of Saturday, that last day of the week, those gargantuan beasts, the great reptiles, some mild, some menacing, thunder across the land and fill the sky. The dinosaurs enjoyed a long run, commanding Earth stage for more than four hours of our week, until a monstrous meteorite landing in the Gulf of Mexico made the climate too cold and ended their reign. By the late afternoon and evening on Saturday, mammals, furry, warm-blooded, and able to withstand a cooler world, flourish and evolve until just three minutes before midnight on that final night of the week, 
Homo sapiens walks erect on two legs, learns to speak, use fire, and create increasingly complex forms of organization. Only about 10,000 years ago in real time, less than two seconds before midnight, in our metaphor, humans develop agriculture and start building cities. At a third of a second before midnight, Buddha is born. At a quarter of a second before midnight, Christ. Only a thirtieth of a second before midnight, we launched the Industrial Revolution. And after World War II, perhaps a hundredth of a second before midnight in our week of creation, again on the final night, the age of consumerism begins, the age of stuff, the age of what I call affluenza. In that hundredth of a second, Brower and others pointed out, we have managed to consume more resources than did all human beings who ever lived all together in previous history on this earth. Think about that. We have diminished our soil our fisheries, our fossil fuels, and who knows what other resources by half. We have caused the extinction of countless other species, and we are dramatically changing the climate. Think about it. Try to grasp in your mind what it means that we have done all of this in the blink of the geological eye. There are people, Brower went on to say, who believe that what we have been doing for that last one one hundredth of a second can go on indefinitely. One of them running for president suggests we can now grow 5% a year, thus doubling our consumption in a decade and a half. If they even consider the issue, these people believe, without evidence, that application of new technologies will allow our continued hyper-exploitation of the planet's resources on and on and on. They are considered normal, reasonable, intelligent. Indeed, they run our corporations and government. But in reality, Brower said, they are stark, raving mad. We can't grow on like this. It will be hard to change their minds and hard to change their beha our behaviors, but not nearly as hard as it would be to change the laws of physics to change the second law of thermodynamics. Yet what will we do as the new science of robotics renders more and more workers obsolete? We must grow even faster, many say, if we're to put these people back to work. The limits suggested by Brower and others often call forth a sense of gloom and doom, a sense that sacrifices for the sake of the biosphere will mean lives of poverty and misery for all. But the good news is that the world doesn't have to continue the same patterns of economic growth and consumerism to sustain high levels of human well-being and happiness. For the past few years, I've been involved in the international pursuit of happiness. It's as American as apple pie, I would argue, this pursuit. After all, Thomas Jefferson enshrined the right to the pursuit of happiness in our Declaration of Independence, and he also emphasized that helping its citizens be happy was, and I quote Jefferson, the sole orthodox purpose of government. But in recent years, the mantle of happiness champion has fallen on the tiny Himalayan nation of Bhutan, whose young king famously proclaimed that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Kids say the darnest things. And he was 16 years old. He was asked by an Australian reporter, so King, what are you going to do to increase your country's gross national problem? He said, well, with all due respect, I think gross national happiness is more important. Since its King made that statement some 40 years ago, Bhutan's call for a focus on happiness has been answered by thousands of researchers around the world. In January of 2013, I was invited to Bhutan along with others among these researchers to advise the government of Bhutan in its pursuit of happiness. What the researchers have done is confirm the wisdom, first of all, of our faith traditions. It is indeed better to give than to receive. Money may not be the root of all evil, certainly not, but neither is it 
the prime source of happiness. Poverty is not pleasant. People who are desperate are not happy. And I don't quarrel with that. But once people live with economic security and modest comfort, other things matter much more than having more and more and more and more. Gratitude, altruism, forgiveness, mindfulness, health, service, tolerance, meaning, appreciation of and access to nature, participatory, transparent, non-corrupt government, and above all, social connection. These are the things we really need to make America great again. And what all of these things require is time. My friend Jorgen Larsson at the Chalmers uh, University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden, and his colleagues have shown that reducing work hours leads to greater levels of perceived well-being. It's no accident that the world's happiest countries are those with the shortest working hours, Denmark, the Netherlands, Finland, uh, and so forth, Norway. But Larsson and the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency go even further. Their research also shows that every 10% reduction in work time also results in a 9% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the main factor in climate change. It's a win-win for well-being and for the environment. So many Swedish businesses are now experiment, experimenting with a six-hour workday for health, for happiness, and for environmental reasons. But it was this country, and I don't know if any of you saw the recent Michael Moore movie, Where to Invade Next, where it's not about the military, Moore's stick as he goes out to all these countries to steal their best ideas rather than the resources. And every time he goes to one of these countries and they're doing something really cool like education in Finland, he asks them where they got the idea, and in, every, in virtually every case they say, oh, we got it from America. The idea was, you just didn't do it. But you had, you had, the, idea, you had the idea first. So, uh, same thing with this 30-hour work week. I, probably many of you may know uh, if you've